So, hi, I'm Alfredo uh, Cosmas. Uh, you can call me Alcos, so it's usually hard to pronounce my name. Uh, so, uh, I'm representing the LibreSpace Foundation, I'm its vice, uh, vice chairman. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how open source actually empowers uh, getting the space, the liberal way. Uh, so, uh, before starting, I have to say that I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, uh, I've been a KD user for the last uh, 23 years or so. Uh, so, yeah, since KD2 came out. Uh, so I'm uh, really happy to be with you. I never actually expected to be here with you. So, uh, how all this started? Uh, well, the thing is that, as most interesting stuff, starts with a small group of people, friends, whatever you like, uh, that uh, met at the local hackerspace in Athens, Greece. Uh, which is focused on uh, open source technologies. That started around uh, 2011. At uh, 2014, during the Space Shuttle Challenge uh, hackathon, we started SATNOX, uh, Satellite Ground Station Network. Uh, same year, we won the Hacker Day Prize, approximately uh, 200k thousand. So we had to decide what to do with all that money, which was a lot during the worst economic crisis in our country. So we say, hey, let's make a non-profit foundation to use that, all that resources uh, in something we love and uh, share back with the community. So 2017, we actually uh, had in orbit our first satellite, UPSAT, uh, which we did for uh, uh, the University of Patras. And uh, 2022, our first uh, open source uh, satellite deployer, just this September. So, all these, uh, this work is powered by vision, by open source, and openness in general, open governance, open hardware, open data. And uh, what we seek to do is to make uh, space acce accessible to all. Uh, to do so, we develop uh, stuff from ground stations to satellite missions, and we adhere to a set of values. Uh, we have our own manifesto, if you'd like, uh, mostly inspired by uh, the, the Mozilla Manifesto and the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and the whole idea is that we use GPL version 6, HGPL, uh, LGPL, CERN licenses, uh, open source data, and we adhere to uh, trying to document everything, all our processes, all our governance, the way we do stuff on our uh, documentation efforts and our repositories. Uh, for an organization that works in space, that's a little bit weird. Most such organizations, especially the ones not funded by governments, don't do so uh, because most of them are either for-profit companies or they are just commonly not very open. You see, uh, what we do, actually, um, being uh, an open source organization allowed us to create some interesting projects like Satnox, uh, like UPSAT, you can actually see in orbit, it was launched by the, uh, Euro, uh, the International Space Station, so you get a nice picture from an astronaut. Uh, and uh, we finally tried to uh, do a lot of uh, hardware development, mostly, nowadays, and a lot of uh, software development that uh, will create more open source data for space. Uh, why we do so? And why we believe that's the way forward? Where first and foremost, open source allows for rapid prototyping and uh, rapid iterations. Uh, for example, uh, the Satnox uh, communication system, uh, the little module we created it is this one over there. Uh, 
which is designed for CubeSat analysis, signal analysis and communications, it's actually also forked by the good people from uh, uh, the Aristotelian University of Thessaloniki next door from here. And they use it, they forked it, uh, they managed to use our design in their own future uh, CubeSat, and that's really interesting because that's not the norm in space. Uh, we've seen that uh, our, this design can also be used for ionospheric uh, disturbance analysis, which for us is interesting because we didn't thought about it. Some other people thought about it. And because it's open source and people can actually see how it works, they can say, you know something, you can also do that with that hardware. We never thought about that. Uh, it also allows for uh, global collaboration, meaning that the Satnox network now has more than 400 ground stations in 50 countries all over the world. You can actually get data from Taiwan, from Russia, from the United States of America, from the Azora Islands in the middle of the freaking ocean, which is really interesting in my humble opinion because that's something usually only uh, great, uh, large superpowers could do a few years ago. Uh, nowadays, with open source and a huge community, you can actually do stuff and uh, lower the barriers of entry because, for example, for a team or a person to participate in uh, Satnox, you can actually need a Raspberry Pi, a few antennas, a simple RTL SDR, and you're good to go. I mean, I have one of these things on my rooftop, and it's simple, and it's uh, a way to give back to the community and a way to participate in a space project. And also, it's a way to participate in a project that you have really interest in. Uh, so, what we managed to understand is that uh, using open source in space is not just developing open source. We, are, we prefer to dog food open source, if you like, meaning that you have to use open source solutions all over your stack. Uh, you have to use open source solutions for uh, daily operations, for community operations, for development needs. It's not only, uh, you know, something, I'm going to create an open source community and uh, use everything uh, closed source. That doesn't go a long way. Uh, you use, uh, sometimes you have to actually assist the development and actually lead the way to get uh, the features you need. And you have to daily, have daily interaction with the uh, open source project you use in order to get some of their good practices and good ideas. And I'm not meaning only about code, I'm not meaning about, ah, yes, they did a really nice thing in that commit, I'm gonna get that. Uh, there are good practices and good uh, uh, community management uh, ideas or com uh, good uh, implementations of uh, things among several projects and uh, having interactions with other projects, like AV, you can actually get what other people are doing and try to copy the right stuff or the stuff that uh, suits you. Uh, and let's be honest, using open source solutions can allow for interoperability within the organization, especially an uh, organization that is mostly remote and distributed around the world and with external entities. For example, we are working with the European Space Agency, we are working uh, with uh, Harvard, we are working with uh, several uh, space agencies across the world. Having uh, open source tools allows us for better communication with our partners. And there are some of, our, uh, of the open source projects we use. Of course, we use uh, Linux, apparently. Uh, but the thing is that we try to uh, use as much as possible across the board. But there are challenges. And being an open source organization in space uh, creates uh, some uh, difficulties, maybe. Because let's face it, space 
is hard. It can be really hard. Orbital hardware has a few ways to be fixed, and as it's launched, you can't do anything about it. You can't go say, ah, oh, you know something, that screw will soon go there. Well, bad luck. Um, but open source can provide a solution for more robust systems. There are several regulations, several standards you have to follow, but following standards, there are established ways so you can actually create frameworks around them, you can work with the standard and actually start to implement ways, uh, to find ways to implement the standards as long as they are not locked in a proprietary way. We are seeing these coming time and time again. There are regulatory issues. There are regulatory issues. Um, and uh, what we believe is that as long as you try to be open and try to implement stuff openly, you will provide solutions for all. And that's key. Uh, to be honest, space used to be the domain of uh, superpowers, of uh, large corporations, of uh, people with resources. Uh, miniaturization, uh, miniaturization allowed lowering the bars of, ent uh, of entry. Open source, on the other hand, can be a catalyst in lowering the bars of entry. Now you can build your own CubeSat in your local hyperspace, and you can actually go in Athens and see people building satellites in the local hyperspace. It's a little bit crazy, ask me. Uh, because you can actually see people working on a space-rated hardware while other people are hacking something really silly, which is really nice, in my uh, humble uh, opinion. Uh, the industry, this industry at least, it's not the only one, uh, is full of proprietary solutions and secrecy. Secrecy has been a staple for space many, many years now. And... Uh, Nowadays, we see that the impact to innovation is so huge that uh, traditional entities, private, public entities, are keen on taking out openness. They've not yet gone full open source, not all of them at least, but you can see that the European Space Agency pro starts to promote open source. NASA has open source repositories. There are processes, there's work to be done, and we're trying to pressure things in going forward in the open source way. Uh, but let's face it, space is also a very capital uh, intensive uh, industry. It needs huge amounts of money to put hardware in orbit, ridiculous amounts sometimes. So that impacts innovation and impacts open source too. Because we are used to as open source creators to create something and uh, have it on our hands, able to use it without any uh, intermediates, without uh, having to uh, invest huge amounts of money to have it even work in its own, uh, on its own. This is not the case in space, but the case is that because it's so capital in, uh, intensive, there are opportunities to actually be able to fund open source development. We are actually an organization that's sustainable, has around 15 to 20 employees. Um, most of them are engineers. I think I'm the less engineer one. And uh, the thing is that what we see is that we are able to sustain an organization for the last eight and plus years. Uh, we believe that uh, certain the same state, Mr. KD, uh, is indicative of the common grounds open source organizations like KD, Share with Liberal Space Foundation. Both foster communities, both try to democratize, if you like, access to technology, and they're thriving through community. We couldn't build stuff without our community. We, th we couldn't build, uh, build stuff without open source tools like GitLab, like uh, Big Blue Button. We couldn't be the way we are without being collaborative, 
and transparent in what we do. What you're trying to achieve and what you are trying to build is similar to, to an extent uh, in what any open source organization does, being open, promoting open source culture, openness in general, and creating a set of open tools for people to use. Of course, there are differences, because let's face it, uh, as I said before, and I'll say it again, and I'll iterate it continuously, space is hard. There are domain-specific challenges. There are tests you have to do. There are regulations you have to fill out. Out there, nice. And uh, while working with, uh, with that kind of, uh, in that kind of uh, environment, you may feel a little bit uh, changed in how things work. You may think that I can't do the, th the things I would like to do because I want to break some stuff. You can't. It's space. They won't let you break stuff in orbit. And in general, they don't let you break stuff around in space and space uh, agencies. I don't know why. Um, most of uh, our work is purpose-driven. That's, that's not really similar to what KD does, because KD, actually, in my humble opinion at least, correct me if I'm uh, wrong, KD actually provides a generic computing experience. You can use KD for whatever you'd like. That's a strong selling point of KD. I'm a KD user, uh, but my uh, use scenarios were different across the many years I've used it. I used to use KD uh, to just browse. I used KD to develop stuff, and it wasn't nice for anyone involved. Uh, and uh, now I use KD for uh, developing uh, open source hardware in space. Well, the thing is that what KD and projects like KD do is provide a very important common ground for us, a very important uh, infrastructure to work with. We can actually use stuff around. And uh, especially uh, the way we see it is that, uh, the way I'm seeing at least, is that KD is uh, flexible enough to adjust to my special user needs as they change. It is really important in the way I see it. Uh, as LSF, though, we need to engage the community in uh, different ways than uh, KD meaning that as we work with a very specialized bunch of people, scientists, uh, space engineers, space agencies, they need engagement in a different way of things. You need more uh, formal uh, engagement sometimes. You need uh, to be a little bit more in the box, if you like. But that thing also changes in the space industry. Because the space industry has learned that you can't innovate always in the box. Uh, the other thing with uh, liberal space is that our deadlines are very hard. Because honestly, you can't say to the uh, launch provider, you know something, guys, can we postpone launching that big rocket of yours because my hardware is not ready yet? Can we? No, I can't say that. I can't say I haven't passed the QA measures they needed for their hardware, their software, because this has to be done. I can't say I didn't do environmental testing, uh, because I have to do it. I have to vibrate the thing before it goes on a rocket. Um, and the thing is that, uh, in contrast with uh, KD, we do have a hardware commitment. We do. Uh, develop hardware. Developing hardware can be, well, apparently hard, uh, but also creates a focus on a special, pla on a singular platform. This isn't the case for KD because KD has to be used 
on any of these things, or hopefully in the future, uh, it could be used on our phones or uh, in any device we use. This is different, but also really interesting in the way such a community must interact. KD has to work with a million devices on a million of systems, doing different uh, user scenarios, which can be really complicated or really extreme. Or Yes, there are 10 users out there that use this weird uh, driver, and you have to figure out a way to use that on your system and create a UI around it and have an experience similar to other KD users' experience, which for me, it's crazy. I don't know how you people do it. So me. Uh, but also, it's something that it's out of our world. We can't believe that it's done. But it's done. We've seen it. We've seen it on our own machines, to be honest. And the other difference is that when you people work and uh, develop uh, KDE, developing KDE is more or less instant. You do stuff, you create your uh, binary, and you test it. I do stuff, I ship them away, I beg the gods or whatever uh, to not skip the launch day because, you know, the weather is bad. Oh, poor you, next month. And um, the other thing is that you stay in the unknown. You don't know how stuff will happen. And sometimes, without your own, I don't know, uh, input, without your own, uh, without you messing around stuff, you have that. That wasn't pretty. I mean, that was a community, a bunch of people. Some people here, I can see, that have seen and worked on uh, the code of this thing. There used to be a uh, PicoBus uh, pocket cube launcher there and two really small satellites of Libre Space Foundation and four Spanish satellites on the PicoBus because we decided to assist our uh, friends in uh, España. So we got the thing in the launch pad, it started flying and kaboom. After one minute or so in the flight, rockets started to wobble and they pressed the button. People worked on this, worked hard to make this thing work, and it didn't. And that's a challenge faced by such organizations uh, that are focused in Spain. You might work a lot and things will fail. And failure is an option. Well, if they didn't press the button, it would be a worse failure, so I understand that. So, what we learned so far on our journey in uh, space the last eight years, well, it's longer than a Star Trek uh, season, uh, set of seasons, it's nice. Um, so, first and foremost, we learned that sky is not the limit for open source. Open source can be everywhere. It can be in orbit, can be in Mars, as JPL showed, uh, on their little helicopter. It's really nice. Uh, challenges can foster innovation. The challenges and the regulations and uh, all that regulatory framework you have to work might allow you to change your mind, be a little bit more flexible than others, and try to implement stuff in a better way. Uh, the way we see it, the most, I think one of the most important things you have to take into account is community participation. We couldn't be here. We couldn't build uh, Satmux Network, which is the biggest satellite ground station network globally. It's bigger than NASA. Without a community, without people building their own ground stations, without people suggesting, ah, you know something, guys. You have to do that because that would be more efficient for that driver over there. I mean, come on, I couldn't have thought that. And uh, it also allows for input in domains that you are not used to work with. I am not a space engineer. I'm trained in healthcare. 
for fuck's sake. I'm a nurse, actually. So, I used to be at least. And uh, having people with domain specific knowledge, or even more, non domain specific knowledge, but knowledge in a certain uh, uh, characteristics of uh, physics or stuff like that, can allow for, innov uh, for innovative uh, solutions and can allow uh, for a community to go further. Uh, in my humble opinion, ah, that, that collaboration sounds like deliberation, nice. <laughs> uh, collaboration can have ge geometric impact, of course, meaning that you can actually see that it's not linear. After, uh, we've seen that when there is a, an amount of people in the project that starts getting a little bit more crowded, has more commits from other people outside the regular. Things change and go faster and faster. Sometimes it's difficult to keep up, but they're faster and faster. And you see that the project has started going slow, mostly working, goes crazy fast because the community is pushing the project forward without you even expecting it to go as fast as it go. Uh, and we actually uh, learned that we have to uh, learn from our peers, learn from other open source organizations, learn from other space organizations, get the knowledge and experience and uh, wisdom, if you like, of the open source community. We've seen it with uh, other organizations too. I think we see it with uh, KD. You, you people have experienced stuff we haven't. You've seen how, to, how difficult it is to migrate to a new environment. We've lived that with uh, KD three to four, and we survived it. And, uh, but the idea is that you learn and uh, write things your peers do, and the good thing, the wrong things that your peers do are actually a way to learn stuff. And we believe that an open source, an open source organization like ours or like you has to learn from the mistakes and the right choices of their peers. Because we have a great thing, for meaning that what you do and what Mozilla does and what uh, I don't know, Debian does is actually a learning process for all of us. You can't implement the same things always because we are not the, uh, the same organization, sadly. But you can actually learn stuff from each other. And you can also collaborate either directly or through umbrella organizations going forward. We have, in my humble opinion, and I think that's shared with many people in the KD community and other open source communities, we have to collaborate on common challenges, we have to collaborate on challenges such as policy coming in our countries, in the EU or uh, in the United States of America, and we have to learn to figure out how to protect our users and protect open source. Uh, I would, I'm open for your questions. I really would like to open a dialogue and start chatting because, okay, doing a presentation is cool, but chatting is better. Of course, you can always send me an email at elcos at Librispace to just say hello, chat, and discuss whatever uh, issues you may have. But I'm open for your question, if you'd like. Shoot me. Let me see. Oh, yes, that one. Wait, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Lydia. Oh, hello, Lydia. So, uh, it has the KiCad uh, uh, logo on it. And the question is, how much of that is going on? How much do you have to design? How much hardware do you have to design and make yourself? Or can, can most of the hardware that goes into the satellites come off the shelf? So, uh, well, here's the thing. Uh, we don't actually design uh, ICs yet. 
I would say. Oh, that, that is always in the rest, and if my, our engineers would uh, have their own thing, uh, I'm pretty sure they would design their own IC to do several kind of stuff. But bear that, all the design is custom, excluding components like that SMA thing or that screw over there or, uh, you know, uh, resistors and uh, stuff like that, and the little LED. Uh, the design, the PCBs, the metallic designs, everything is custom and it's open source. Designed with KiCad and FreeCAD. On an open source repository, you can actually download and build it yourself, put it on your own rocket and <laughs> call it a day. Uh, it's a really interesting project. I, I, well, yeah. That's uh, seed, uh, that's uh, that's a really interesting one actually. That's Sidlock. Sidlock is a satellite identification and location protocol. We designed this for the European Space Agency, and uh, its thing is that it actually emits a beacon uh, that uh, allows for uh, well, it's not a satellite, spacecraft actually, spacecraft identification and location. So. Why uh, this thing is interesting? Well, it emits a beacon, uh, a certain kind of signal, which allows for uh, identifying a satellite or a spacecraft easily, and allows it to be located easily using uh, uh, math, mostly. So the thing is, uh, um, the interesting thing is that Having an open source protocol, having an open protocol is cool. Having a protocol that is actually implemented in an open source way is way cooler. <laughs> and that's the way you, we should work. Because if we went out there and build a pro pro proprietary solution, which would, what, what, what's the meaning? Why? Why should anybody adopt such a thing. It's too big, it's five by five centimeters, it's huge. Uh, and this design, this actual design, will go in Ariane 6, uh, it's an inaugural flight, and will actually allow us to track Ariane 6 using Sidlock. And yes, you have to use KiCad on that. And yes, you have to use FreeCAD on that. And yes, you have to do, to do everything open source if you are willing to do something that's impactful for uh, the space industry. If you are just trying to make a bug, then yeah, go full proprietary, I don't care. But if you're trying to create something that will have uh, an impact to people, to universities, to university teams, to even Corporations, someone uh, trying to build their own satellite because they're making some. Yeah, you have to go fully open. And let them do their commits and let them do uh, their forks and have fun. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Yes, please, please. You, uh, you mentioned ground stations a couple of times. What is a ground station and is that something that we as people living on Earth would want to set up in our backyards and what does it do that will help people? Yes, so a ground station can be that city and then over there, which is not that big. Uh, something like that. I have to admit that uh, uh, there is also a uh, bigger ground station in the network, the Dwingelo Telescope in the uh, Netherlands is actually a Satmux ground station, which is a little big for my backyard. I, am, I don't have such a big back, uh, backyard. It's a little bit bigger than my house, actually. <laughs> so the thing is that people create uh, satellite ground stations or actually um, make their own or uh, use older type of hardware used by radio amateurs to build one because they'd like to share data with their community. Some people 
find that interesting because it can actually be an easy uh, weekend project for them. It wasn't easy for me, but I'm not good with Black and Deckers <laughs> at all. So, uh, but the thing is that people like to assist other communities and other uh, university teams. Most satellites, uh, a ground station actually receives data from a satellite, okay? Which uh, orbits low Earth orbit. So it only has around five, 10 minutes per day to actually track the satellite. Mm -hmm. So if there is a university team, like the university team at, uh, uh, next door, <laughs> uh, that needs data, they can use my own ground station, they can use uh, my friend Cor's ground station in the United States, or they can use a ground station in China, in Taiwan, yes, they, they are both in the network, or in Russia, I don't know, and uh, actually do stuff. So in, my, in that case, they mostly like to assist other communities. So, yeah. Uh, so, regarding hardware, as far as I know, uh, most of the stuff that uh, is designed to go to space uh, have to be subjected to very rigorous testing. Uh, and uh, the testing equipment to do that is very expensive and also proprietary. Under even the specifications most of the times, from my experience, even the specifications like dimensions of a vacuum chamber, for example, are under NDA too. Uh, do you have any uh, solutions you are doing yourself in order to reach the same standard that, it's, that is required? That's a great, almost insider view of our project. So, here's the thing. Uh, he is literally from the university next door. Yes, <laughs> I, know. I know. I know him, okay? <laughs> I know people. Uh, so, here's the thing. Um, yes. We are trying to have our own uh, designs. We are trying to build our own vacuum chambers. We are trying to build our own clean rooms. And we want these all to be open source documented. All right now, what we do is go to the University of Catalonia and do stuff there. And we pay stuff to do stuff there. We have to pay stuff to do environmental testing, we have to pay stuff to do uh, vibration checks, and in the future, we hope we will be able to have our own stack and the stack available to open source projects in general. And an infrastructure, literal infrastructure, physical infrastructure, that is an open source project can send their own uh, hardware to be tested, hopefully with a person together to monitor the procedure, because I'm not I have, yeah, other questions. That's great, actually. So I have another similar question, I suppose, of the collaboration with different projects and it being open source is amazing, and kind of have you been able to have any success with getting some of these proprietary companies to open source their stuff, so kind of like coming from the other direction? I'll try to be frank about it. No. <laughs> it's a, uh, here's the thing. Uh, especially in space. Space, as I said before, is a very, very capital uh, incentive uh, thing. And people tend to be very protective of their pursued IP. It's usually not something very interesting. Sometimes you've seen devices, you've seen hardware that are used around and sell them by big companies. You say, what? You charge so much money for that? Why? And it's so simple. On the other hand, yes, but that has uh, orbital pedigree, as they say. Because it's been there and it worked. So they charge whatever the hell they want for that. But the thing is that these companies, most of these companies at least, see that there might be another way to do stuff. 
Interestingly, the space agencies say that there is another way to do stuff because the space agencies want to protect their own interests and their interest of the people they represent. So maybe the space agencies say, yes, I need that open source. And usually that's where we come in <laughs> and say, okay, let's work together with the community, let's work together with large integrators, maybe even, I won't say names yet because I haven't signed anything. But <laughs> if you start to see people Look, start looking about uh, open source in space. They see that it might make sense, it's not a good fit for our business plan, but yeah, maybe some other time, we'll see. But things change. The guys from uh, uh, next door, they've seen it. Already they've seen it. They already use uh, some of our hardware, right? And they already fought it, and they already put it on their own way. And they see that they might even go forward in making their own open source stuff, because they are cool. But how many people out there are cool? I've seen uh, recently, uh, I think it's, it was Quetzal, uh, a CubeSat from Ecuador, I think, I'm not 100% sure, that recently got uh, released as a, an open source project. And it's trapped on Satmux. You can actually see a really nice graphic display of uh, it working in uh, space, and it's really cool. And the thing I see is that we might see change from university teams first, pushing the envelope forward, making open source solutions because they need them to work better, and because, let's be honest about it, uh, the guys next door might not always be next door. They might go to the industry, they might go somewhere else, they might change career and become uh, you know, artists. But the thing is that the source code has to remain there. They're a public funded university. They need to use their creation for the betterment of everyone. Elsewhere. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, we're sort of out of time. Oh, so I'm going to use my session chair position to ask the last question. Oh. You've gone to space with open source. Where are you going to go next? <laughs> well, still we are going to space. But the thing is that we only reached lower orbit, right? Okay, there's, there's plenty of space below, beyond low Earth orbit. <laughs> Thank you, Eleftherios Cosmas. Thanks.